Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning on this Mother's Day. And may God bless you richly as we come to the foot of the cross as we worship the Lord and give him praise and honour. Come let us worship the Lord as we pray together, as we come before that throne of grace, as we come into his presence, let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the mighty God. You are seated in glory. You have the... Son, our Saviour Jesus, at your right hand, you have the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship you, the Almighty God, the God who has created, the God who rolled back the waters of the mighty Red Sea as we sang. And we acknowledge, Lord, that you have all power and all might and all authority. And even as we come before you, Lord, we acknowledge that we do not have a right to do that. But that was your desire. And for that reason, you sent your son Jesus to be our savior, that the barriers of sin that keep us from your presence would be pushed down, that they would be flattened, and that by your grace, and by your mercy, we can come into the presence of our heavenly father. And we do that today. We do it with reverence, we do it with awe, and we do it with great gratitude in our hearts that you have loved us so much. But as we do that, Lord, we are aware that, uh, that we have sinned. We are aware that in your presence, in your holy presence, there can be no sin. And so we need to confess our sins. We need you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin to show us those things that need to be changed. And even as we do that, Lord, we come and we say, speak to us, put your finger there, Lord, and give us the grace to acknowledge it. Give us the grace to say, yes, Lord, we have sinned. We have come short of your glory. And your word tells us that if we confess that sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so in our minds, Lord, and in our thoughts, we come, so often when we come to confession, we, we trot out the same list of sins. But Lord, we come, we want to repent, we want to turn from that sin. We want, Lord Jesus, for you to give us the victory, the victory that you brought to us because you broke the power of sin and death when you rose from the dead. And so we confess today, Lord, not in a, in a hopeless, maybe this will work way, but with an awareness of the almighty power of God to keep us from falling and to present us faultless in your presence. And so come, Lord Jesus, cleanse us, we pray. I cannot confess somebody else's sin. We've all got to do that for ourselves. And so, Lord, we come. We ask that you would speak to us today. We ask that you would open your word, your word that has been there for millennia and yet still has a relevance to our daily living. So open your word to us. Give us understanding. Let it impact on the way we live and the things that we do. And may you be glorified in our lives. And we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to read now from the word of God and we read from Mark's gospel, chapter 7. 
Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, reading from verse 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding the tr to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And so the Pharisees and teachers of the law ask Jesus, why don't your disciples live according the tr to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have to go you have let go of the commands of God and you're holding on to human traditions. And he continued You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that that what might have been used but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and the, or mother is Corban that is devoted to God then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. May God give us an understanding as we later consider some of the truths in this word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you at a time when all around us the world is in trouble. There are wars, there's crime, there's corruption, not just in our land, across the world. Governments are falling and shaking and leaders are being replaced. And, and we come, Lord, and we know that the heart of man is deceitful above all things. And we want to pray for this world. We want to pray, Lord, for we want to pray for leaders who are godly, leaders who will acknowledge you, leaders who will not be there, Lord, to come and to to just enrich themselves and to uh, gather power but leaders who will have a heart for the people leaders who will be sensitive to the promptings of your spirit and that's not a new problem lord right through the old testament we find Israel again and again and again getting into trouble because the leadership wasn't doing the right thing. We think of the book of Judges that tells us that story, that cycle, that they, the nation would be restored and then they would go well and then they would fall into sin and it would have to be restored again by another judge, another leader. And I pray that in this world today and particularly in our land, that you will raise up honourable leaders, that you will raise up leaders, Lord, who are prepared to lead this nation and the peoples of the world in a way that is honouring to you, that you will not be excluded from the thinking of the leaders, from the thinking of the legislators, from the thinking of the magistrates and the judges, but that they would know that you, Lord, have set rules in place. You have set a template there for us to follow. And so we commit this world to you. We pray today earnestly for those, Lord, who are suffering, 
suffering because of war, suffering because their leadership has made the wrong decisions, suffering for those who have seen their homes destroyed, suffering because there is no food. And you've hardened the hearts of so many as food supplies are cut off, as medical supplies are not available. And we pray for those in need. We pray, Lord, that while we can do nothing about it here today, we pray that you would comfort their hearts, that you would enfold them in your love, that you would draw them to yourself, and that they would find in you a loving and a caring God. And how hard that is to even think that you are loving and caring when they are facing that sort of hardship. And yet, Lord, you didn't create that. It's the sinfulness of men and women. And the things that we do have a knock-on effect. Other people are affected by the words we speak, by the thoughts we think, by the actions we take. And so we pray for this world. We pray for those who are suffering. We pray, Lord, for those who are ill. We pray for those, Lord, who are lonely. We pray, Lord, for those whose hearts are filled with fear. And we ask that by your grace, they would know that you are a friend, that you are a certain rock stability in the future, and that they would turn to you. And so, Lord, we come and we have many unspoken prayers in our hearts, and you know them because you know all things. And we pray that in simple faith, as we commit those to you, we would know that you are the God who hears, cares, loves, and in your time, takes the appropriate action. And so, Lord, bless us, we pray. Bless those that we love. Bless those who love us. And we ask that in your name. Amen. I grew up in a church that for several years had a practice that on Mother's Day, everyone coming into the church was given a rose. If your mother was still living, it was a red rose. If your mother was no longer alive, it was a white rose. And so we acknowledged our mothers. I could not wish for a better mother. I thank God for her. And now that I'm living on my own and know what she experienced, I, I wish that I'd done more for her. Jesus recognized his responsibility for his mother. I want to read some verses from John 19. Near the cross stood his mother. These words are famous as part of the the words spoken from the cross. Near the cross stood, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. And so Jesus acknowledges, even in his dying moments, he acknowledges that responsibility that he has for a mother. And it's very significant. From that time on, this disciple, which we believe is John, took her into his own home. Why John? Why not one of the brothers of Jesus? Why not James or another family member? Well, at this stage, the rest of Jesus' family were not believers. 
It was only after the resurrection when Jesus, the risen Lord, went to see James that James believed and became part of the church leadership. Jesus knew fully the Old Testament law. He knew what was required. We go through the Ten Commandments, the first speak of our relationship with God, and the last four speak of our relationship with people. And the first of those last four is honor your father and your mother, the seventh commandment. And in our reading from Mark chapter 9, we see that Jesus was at odds with the Pharisees over this very commandment. Listen again to what Jesus says to the Pharisees and to the teachers. And I'll read from verse 6, just those few verses to remind us what we read. Isaiah was right, says Jesus. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have to let go of the commands of God and are ho you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And Jesus continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, that if anyone declares that that what might have been used to help them, father and mother, is Corban. Do you know that word? Corban. It means devoted to God. Then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition. Jesus knew what the law required of a son to his mother and father. He knew what was needed. But there was a thing, Corban, and it's mentioned many times in the Old Testament. Very few people even know the word. And that said that if you gave something to God, you could not take it back. And so they would say, Lord, I'm giving you my all. And of course the priests would know that and they would take it and put it in the temple. And now they go to their parents and they say, sorry guys, all of our money is given to the Lord. We can't support you anymore. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, here is a law, honor your mother and father. And then you guys come and you apply Corbin in this way that they don't have the money or the means or the resources to do that. And so Corbin is a gift to God which becomes a gift to the temple and it's irrevocable. They say, God, I give you all I've got. Sorry, Mom, there's nothing for you. It's all God's. And Jesus says to them, this is man-made. It's a man-made distortion of what the Bible teaches. You nullify the word of God by your tradition, he says. And Jesus spoke out against it and he acted against it. And so he lovingly, as he dies, he lovingly sees his mother standing there. And he says, woman, here is your son. Not woman in a, in a derogatory sort of way. It was a way that they used to speak. It was a, a loving and respectful way. Saying perhaps she's a lady. Woman, here is your son. And to John, here is your mother. Now the high church and the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches teaching about Mary causes Protestants and nonconformists to steer clear of Mary. She is not the mother of God. She is the servant of God. And she says so. When the angel Gabriel tells her what's going to happen, she says, I am the Lord's servant. 
Frank G. Slaughter, in his book The Cross and the Crown, gives an insight into Mary, the mother of young Jesus. Mary and Joseph bring baby Jesus to the temple for dedication. A godly man named Simeon takes Jesus in his arms and says to Mary, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that is spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too and the sword will pierce your own soul too and frank slaughter in his book sees jesus the toddler or the young child playing in his father's workshop i used to do that i used to go out and use my dad's tools in the in the garage and work on his bench and there jesus is and he's playing with his father in his father's workshop and uh, one of the sharp tools cuts him and he cries and he goes running to his mother mommy mommy and she washes the wound and dresses it and what goes through her mind as she sees her son's blood mary unlike the rest of the family followed jesus that special relationship between a mother and her boy child and she heard jesus say he was going to die she was there she was in the crowd she heard him say i'm going to jerusalem and they're going to put me to death she heard those things and simeon's words to her 30 years previously must have come rushing back as she recalled them and now it has happened there he is hanging on the cross what it is for a mother to see her child suffer what a what it is for a mother to stand there and see her son die witnessing the pain witnessing the humiliation witnessing the shame the suffering the death of her son a son who even in death did not forget his mother and his duty woman here is your son here is your mother and John took her into his home let us pray together Lord Jesus we come to you we thank you for that example of caring for parents I pray Lord for the mothers who are here who are alone who haven't been taken into somebody's home I pray for the ladies here who have wanted to be mothers and have not been. And yet in so many ways they have mothered their nieces, their nephews, the children in the church, in the Sunday school, in the community. There's that saying, Lord, that it takes a village to raise a child. And I come and I pray for mothers everywhere, some of them, are under severe stress some of them do not know how to feed their children today some of them are dealing with broken hearts because children have rebelled because children are sick and don't seem to be getting better We come, Lord, and we commit those mothers to you. We thank you for them. We thank you for this scriptural model of our behavior towards them. I thank you for my mother, and I thank you for her mother, and for those who have gone before, and for those who are orphans, for those who have an empty place in their home because there is no mother. That Lord Jesus, you would just minister into their lives. That you would minister into their lives through us, through other people. That they would know that they are loved and cared for. For 
child-led households where there are no parents. And there are a lot of those around, Lord. We come and we present to you today in humble trust the homes of our nation, the place where children learn. And, O oh Lord, that we would know the sanctity of the home. And so in simple faith today, we thank you that we have a Father in heaven because we are children of God through trusting in Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that where there is deficiency in, in the caring that we receive, you raise up other people. But you also come and by your Spirit you minister into our situation. And we thank you for that. Lord, some of us can do more for those who are mothers, for the widows and the orphans, and yet we don't. And maybe your Spirit will speak to us today about that. I can't convict anybody, but the Spirit of God can. And so if you would open up a ministry for any one of us to be involved with the the mothers who are on their own, the mothers whose children are far away, those who would be mothers but haven't been. If you would open up that sort of ministry, find us obedient, find us willing. And so come Lord Jesus, use us we pray even as you establish and reinforce the home life of this nation. We ask it in your name. Amen. And so receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go well and walk in his light. Bye-bye.